Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Wake up, Link. How does one tell a story in a game such as this? In theory, it may sound like a simple task to achieve, but when you look at most games that tell a story, the reason they can do so is because they follow a very strict formula. When you play these games, it becomes very clear that you're not necessarily in control of the overall narrative. It's why linear games are so common, and usually consist of traveling from point A to B. This is done because the idea of having freedom in a story-driven game seems very counterintuitive. A story is defined as an account of imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment. As you would expect, stories are always meant to be told in a certain chronological order. If not, then the audience would get confused as to how the events play out. So having a story in a game structured like Breath of the Wild would run the risk of having key events play out in an improper order. Because of this, the thought of having a game with freedom as well as a good story seems impossible. Some games may try to do this with open worlds, but since it consists of a going from point A to B to C structure, it really is just an illusion to the player. If a story is implemented, it would theoretically need to be dumbed down to a point where the chronological sequence of events wouldn't matter. But Breath of the Wild manages to tell a story while keeping that feeling of freedom, and it does so in a unique way where the player can skip certain story sections and play at their own pace. The developers achieved this by implementing certain design choices in the game so that there was no correct way to play. In this first episode of the documentation of Breath of the Wild, we'll be looking at these design choices along with the pros and cons of their inclusion to the overall game. At its most basic, the plot of a story can be broken down into three parts. The beginning, middle, and end. For Breath of the Wild, the beginning is when the main story is presented to the player through Rome Bosphoramus Hyrule along with Link's objective to defeat Calamity Ganon. The middle is everything that takes place from that point until he reaches Ganon, and then the end would be the final boss and conclusion. First of all, Breath of the Wild succeeds in delivering its story while retaining the feeling of freedom in the very first location found in the game. And that's because it manages to give you the entire beginning of a plot in what is essentially a tutorial. But since the Great Plateau is designed in a very non-linear way, the player can play at their own pace. That doesn't mean that this part doesn't contain tutorial-like elements, though. It is impossible to leave this location until you complete certain parts of the story. You need to first activate the tower, then complete four shrines until finally traveling to the top of the Temple of Time. But because of how big the Great Plateau is, as well as the many other things you can do there, it feels like each playthrough is different. And that certainly can't be said for most other tutorials and games. But this design choice allows a story to still be told, despite giving the player all this freedom. Because right before you leave the plateau, you are confronted by the former King of Hyrule who tells you all about the land's past, along with your role as Princess Zelda's knight. Through this one cutscene, you are given the entire plot of the story as well as your main objective. And the moment you are given the paraglider to leave the Great Plateau, the game's plot shifts into the middle portion. This is made even clearer when you are given your main objective to defeat Ganon. At this point, the middle of the story depends solely on how you play the game. You can stay on the Great Plateau to train more before you confront the Harsh Wild, continue the main story by completing shrines and freeing the Divine Beasts, or just skip all that and head straight to Hyrule Castle. This is all just a basic summary of Breath of the Wild's tutorial. I'll be covering it in a lot more detail in another video, but long story short, the game tricks the player by putting the entire setup of Breath of the Wild's events in a well-designed tutorial section. But, the middle section is where the game once again uses a trick to keep both the story and freedom part. This is done by having most of the story take place in the past. Because these are events that have already happened, what the player does in the present will have no effect on the overall plot of the game. Whether you free the Divine Beasts or not, the Great Calamity was still a thing that happened. But now the question is, how do you present the past story in a believable way? Well, the game mostly does this through three things. Recoverable memories, written diary entries, and character exposition. But before we go through all three of these, a problem still arises with this method of storytelling. Because the story is from past events, why does a main character feel the need to learn about them? That's where amnesia comes into play. While it's cliché, it is a very effective way to tell a story in a game with this much freedom. That's because the player can relate to Link in every way. At the start of the game, once you leave the shrine, you are automatically put into the world without any sort of guidance or objectives. And because Link has no memories, 
everything that is new to you is also new to him. This is a brilliant way of implementing story within a game such as this, since all decisions made by the player won't affect the narrative due to it mostly taking place in the past. So let's start with the first method of storytelling, the memories found within Hyrule. There are a total of 18 that the player can find. 12 of them are found by visiting certain locations represented by pictures taken with the Sheikah Slate. The other six can be discovered by other means, such as playing through a Divine Beast quest or obtaining the Master Sword. Five others do exist in the form of DLC, but I'll focus on the ones in the main game. These memories are the main form of storytelling in Breath of the Wild, as it helps us learn of the key events that played out before Hyrule had fallen to Calamity Ganon. But this also establishes Link's relationship with the other champions without going into too much detail. Each one of these helps make the story a bit clearer, but only giving away enough so that the player is both satisfied but also feels an incentive to learn more. But aside from giving the player more knowledge of what happened before the Great Calamity, its second purpose is to establish the relationship between Link and Princess Zelda. This is mainly done to make the player want to defeat Ganon so that Zelda can be freed from her 100 year struggle. This is the part where the memories excel in, as it shows the development of Zelda in a way that has never been seen. The tension that is created by the two is clear from the first memory, Subdued Ceremony. We pray for your protection, and we hope that, that the two of you will grow stronger together as one. which eventually turns into a close relationship until Link is wounded and placed in the shrine to recover. However, there is never a point in the game where collecting these memories is key to defeating Ganon, and while there is a specific order to them, the protagonist having amnesia means that, as long as these memories are obtained, the order of recovering them is unnecessary. There are rewards to find them, such as the champion's tunic and finding the location to the final memory, but they can all be skipped if the player chooses to do so. But, Breath of the Wild remembers what choices you make, and because of that, everyone's first playthrough will be different. This can be seen through a few design choices. If the player does seek out all the memories before defeating Ganon, an extra cutscene plays after the credits. Even certain in-game events will play out differently depending on what story you skip. A great example is if you make your way to Zora's Domain without meeting up with Sidon. Once you arrive at the throne room, an alternate cutscene will play. And who might you be? The Zora King is not accepting visitors at this time. I shall escort you out. <gasps> Pardon my manners, but are you a Hylian? Nintendo acknowledges how some people may play the game in a different order of events and goes out of their way to accommodate the experience for everyone. It's one of the most impressive things about Breath of the Wild. Some characters in the game also show this, as they may give you an objective, but acknowledge you if you have already done it. As you would guess, doing so would take a lot of time and effort, and Nintendo honestly didn't need to go as far as they did. But how they went about it definitely deserves recognition and praise. But now we come to the second method of story storytelling. Diary Entries In my personal opinion, this is where the game's story begins to suffer. Many locations in the world of Hyrule will contain written journals or diaries. This is how the game puts less important characters in the spotlight, whether essential to the main plot or not. One of the reasons to do this is so each champion has a similar amount of development with Link as Princess Zelda did in the memories. But keeping this in separate diaries helps the player focus on the two main characters and the building relationship between the two. This creates a problem, though because when you compare the main story to everything else found within written entries, you realize that most of the interesting parts are not shown aside from being mentioned briefly by characters. This is less of a problem because they are only found in journals, and more so due to everything happening in the past. The game gives you all of these interesting characters and events that you, sadly, will never be able to witness yourself. It's unfortunate, considering there are ways that the game could have immersed the player more into these stories. For example, we find out that the Queen of Hyrule had unexpectedly passed away when Zelda was six. A great way to implement this into the present day is having a side quest where you, the player, tries to solve the mystery of why she had died. Even if it was in the form of written entries, it would give the player a sense of satisfaction and make you feel that you had contributed something to the story. There are other events, such as Link's first clash with a guardian and Cass's mentor that could have been further established. A great example of a story done right is from the side quest, The Stolen Heirloom, where the player finds out that Dorian was an ex-Yuga clan member who was forced to give information to the clan so his kids would not be harmed. 
I had made a video last year going over the complete timeline for Breath of the Wild. It included everything, from memories to the written entries by characters. The whole video was 56 minutes, and 30 minutes of that was only talking about past events. It just shows how there was so much potential to expand on the story told in the present. It doesn't have to conflict with the feeling of freedom of the story either, but it would have helped. With that said, it can also be seen as a positive since giving players the choice to locate all of the diary entries lets them play at their own pace. And I do agree with that. I just feel that Nintendo could have done a bit more to connect past events to the present through things such as side quests and characters. And that leads into the final method of storytelling character exposition. This is when other characters give the player background information important to the main story. There are a few times where this is noticeable. The first is when Kane Rome confronts Link on the top of the Temple of Time. In other words, when the beginning of the plot takes place. Zelda also does small bits of character exposition through Link's journey, such as after activating the Great Plateau Tower. The last form of it is whenever Link talks to people that were alive back then. More specifically, the Sheikah Research Trio consisting of Impa, Pura, and Robbie. Many times within stories, character exposition seems forced, especially when the protagonist has amnesia. But Breath of the Wild does make this work, specifically because it limits the amount of people who do the storytelling. In the post-apocalyptic future, most characters do not know of the Great Calamity and Link's role. Keeping the exposition to those few that were alive to experience the events makes it feel less shoehorned in and more natural. And then, there is the last part of the plot, more specifically, the ending. This is a topic that will be left for a different day, but I will make sure to go into more detail about it when the time comes. I hope you enjoyed the first episode of this new series. There are going to be a lot of videos for it, which will take a ton of work. Because of that, if you enjoyed, make sure to subscribe and share with your friends. Next time, we'll be covering the beginning of Breath of the Wild and how it succeeds as a tutorial to the main game. I appreciate your support, and we'll see you in the next episode.